have a moment of silence for all those who lost their lives in Pittsburgh this past week, as well as any who may have been affected by acts of hate and intolerance. Thank you. So welcome to the Social Justice Symposium tonight. We're so happy to have you all here. Don't be afraid of my people sitting in the back. We have plenty of chairs up here up front, so go ahead and come on forward. I see you in the back. Go ahead and come on up. We have places up here in the front. Um, my name is Paul Anderson II. I currently serve as the BEAD and Diversity Education Coordinator for our office. It's an annual program that we have every single year here in the fall. We had to reschedule it because of a hurricane, but we're happy to be back. We hope you all enjoy the program, and there will be some, some things going on a little bit later, such as a raffle with some door prizes, so please stay tuned for that. Enjoy the rest of the program, and now I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, Great Nation, special guest. I am Red Nicholson, and on behalf of the Office for Diversity and Inclusion, uh, but I am honored to stand before you and give the purpose of this evening's symposium. With the increased number of hate crimes, discrimination, and racism acts, this symposium is very timely. We are honored to have Dr. Gavin to be with us as she shares ways to dismantle racism and discrimination. Our hope is that you, you leave this event with a better understanding of what discrimination and racism look like. But more importantly, ways to expand. Again, thank you all for coming and showing your support. Yeah. 
We asked what we should do to improve our communities and everyone's drugs, and they cut the funding for the programs to keep us off the streets and ask us why we sell drugs. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. And part of the mechanics for oppression is to, is to pervert a people to such an extent that they become the instruments of their own oppression. So as I leave the stage, please marinate on the earlier question. If at all possible, I'll give you an answer if I could, but if we're not giving this to the ghetto, who do you blame for the loser? I might need some manual. Okay. Yeah, great. Can we just go to back to the to the Yeah, we can. Nope. Okay, great. Do you want me to just verbally ask you to? Or did you Okay, great. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about the approach that I have and sort of the place that I begin at. So um, one area where I begin is to acknowledge that there is what I consider to be a massive gap between what scholars who study race take for granted and therefore don't even talk about with the public versus what the public knows about race and racism, especially the white public. And so this gap is a, a serious concern of mine that's come to my attention as I've been teaching and working in this area in the community for, um, for many years. And so as a white anti-racism educator, one contribution that I can make is to try to help bridge this gap between what the scholars already acknowledge and therefore don't really talk about very much versus what the public recognizes. Okay. So what I would like to do tonight is to highlight three myths that, uh, that people, especially white people, are often taught that obscure the reality of racism. And then, um, then we have a short activity, because I am a teacher and I do like interactive classroom experiences, and we can do that on any scale. So we'll have a short activity, and then I'll ask a couple of the tables to report back, and we can have some additional Q&A. So I'm just gonna ask you to hold off on questions for the moment. You can jot them down and keep track of them, um, but I think it'll be easier if I just highlight these three key myths first because they are all interrelated, and then we'll come back to um, questions and all of that as you go along. 
And I also just want to mention that um, I'm only ever so slightly touching on the issues in this presentation that I go into a lot more detail about in my, um, in my book. And so I just want to acknowledge that. The book has a lot more information about this. Um, my website, dividednolonger.com, has a lot more information. And if you're interested in having access to this PowerPoint, there are a couple of copies on tables, but it is also uploaded for you um, if you're interested uh, in having a digital access to it, it's on my blog, again, dividednolonger.com. Okay. Great, I think we went ahead a little bit. Can you go back to this? Yeah. I'm trying. We're going to let that reboot. Don't worry. Teachers always have like many backup systems, right? All right. So while we're rebooting the computer to hopefully just get things um, working, um, I'm still going to talk through the slides. So if you have the slides in front of you, you're welcome to take a look at it. If you don't, that's OK. Don't worry. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. My mic isn't on anymore. OK, no problem. I can also, is the other one working? OK. OK, no worries. I'll use my extra teacher voice. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm, if you have the handout in front of you, I'm on the bottom of page two. And if you don't have it, that's OK. Don't worry. So the first concept that I just want to talk a little bit about is the concept of an ideology. All right, so raise your hand if that word is familiar, ideology. OK, super, great. So this is a really critical idea because it emphasizes the way that indoctrination works. So when you're being indoctrinated, do you know you're being indoctrinated? No, because that's how it works. If you knew you were being indoctrinated, then you wouldn't be able to be indoctrinated, right? So an ideology is a belief system you are indoctrinated into without being aware of being indoctrinated into it. So that's where its power comes from. And so I use this, this concept of ideology as a way to talk about the myths that white people in particular are taught about race and racism. Okay? And so the first 
myth that I'll talk about in a moment focuses on this idea that race is biological, okay? And that is a myth. It is a false ideology. I'll say more about that in a moment. But ultimately, oh, here we are, sorry, okay. Ultimately, this myth is both damaging and dangerous because it blocks our view of what I call the racism machine. And so that's what I begin with in my book because to me that's the sort of first thing that we need to um, take a look at. Okay, great, if you could just go back. that they believed that blacks have less sensitive nerve endings than whites, 
they continued to ask them, well, what would you do about it based on um, your decisions about pay, potential patient treatment? And so these, again, are our future doctors who said in this study that they would make decisions about pain treatment for patients in the future based on the race of the patients, giving greater pain treatment to white patients, less pain treatment to black patients. And we can see that this happens throughout the US. Okay, this is not about the South, this is about the US. And so there are cases where um, they've studied the um, children who go into emergency rooms with um, both with you know, black children and white children going into emergency rooms with the same symptoms of appendicitis and treated differently in terms of pain treatment based on, based on their race. Okay, so there's example after example. So these are just a couple of examples. The reality though is that there is no inherent or biological or genetic difference between groups that we call races because race is a social construct, a human invention. And in some ways to think about this is that human DNA is about 99.9% .9 identical throughout the entire planet. Another way to think about this is that there is no scientific, biological, or genetic way to separate human beings into, quote, races. So again, the myth is that human races are biologically different. The reality is that that is just simply not true. It is a false ideology, a dangerous one, a damaging one. Okay. So I want to um, point out to you a really helpful documentary, if you're not aware of it already, called Race, the Power, of an illusion. Has anyone come across that? Okay, if you haven't seen it, it looks like most of you haven't, it's extremely helpful. And uh, PBS released this more than 10 years ago. It's actually a three-part series. But the first part, a little bit less than an hour, again called Race, the Power of an Illusion, does an amazing job in 50, 55 minutes at debunking the false ideology that race is biological. I found it really helpful to show this in my classes, I show this in the community, in many, many different venues. It is very accessible. And they also have a really helpful website. And I'm just gonna um, highlight a couple of things from their website, and this again is pulled directly from there. They again emphasize race has no genetic basis, human subspecies don't exist, skin color, really is only skin deep, and most variation is within, not between races. They have a, um, a website that includes 10 things everyone should know about race. These are a couple of those, you can Google that, and you can also um, find it on my own website, and these are, again are just a couple of those things that they think would be helpful for everyone to know. Okay, so let's keep going, and we can come back to this a little bit later if you want, if you have questions. Okay, so we're moving closer. We're seeing the racism machine. If we chip away at the false ideology that race is biological and recognize the reality that race is a human invention, a social construct, then the racism machine becomes more visible. So we've chipped away at the obstacle, the false ideology, clearing away a bit of the rubble, and now we can see the visibility of the racism machine. All right, that prompts us to ask, well, what is this machine? Who built it? When? Why? How? That brings us to the next myth. Okay, that is myth number two. The myth that race has always existed, whoops, we need to go back a little bit here. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, great. The myth that race has always existed and that whiteness has always existed. And this last part is really critical, especially when we're talking about the mythology taught to white people. This idea that they have been taught whiteness has always existed. 
So the reality is actually, again, race is an invention. And specifically, now we're talking about when, a relatively recent human invention. You might think, well, the 1600s is a long time ago, but in the scope of human history, it is relatively recent. And we need to understand what is happening and why. So one place that we can look for this location of the invention of race is in colonial Virginia in the 1600s. I find this a really helpful place to look at because there is a significant archive, even online now, of the history of the laws that they passed in colonial Virginia. And you can almost see a before moment and an after moment, before the invention of race and after the invention of race. So let's take a look at the, the before moment. So before race was invented, in the early days of this colony in Virginia, the line between servant and slave was ambiguous. <coughs> people did not identify as black or white. And that is very hard for us to understand because we take that for granted now. But in those earliest days, they did not identify as black or white. Instead, they identified by nationality, by language, by religion. Skin color is not a dividing line. Sure, they would recognize it, but it's not the dividing line. Instead, the dividing line is between the elite wealthy landowners and the laborers who are working the land. Okay, laborers that we would call black, that we would call white, but didn't necessarily focus on that division themselves. Okay, Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. Raise your hand if this is familiar. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, this is, for me, one of the most important, important moments in the history of race and racism. Okay, not something, certainly not something that I learned about in high school. Um, but in this moment, we can see laborers we would call white, that we would call black, rebel together against their oppressive working conditions, against a small group of colonial elite. And how did the colonial elite react to this big rebellion? Not very well, right? They were scared, they were terrified, they were threatened. Okay, small number of elite, large group of laborers rising up. Okay, and there were several of these rebellions, not just this one, but this is the most famous. And incidentally, it's not about Bacon. It's Nathaniel Bacon, not Bacon, Bacon. Sorry, <laughs> Okay, so we have a large group of laborers rising up, rebelling, and the classic system to squash that rebellion is divide and conquer. So the division comes in in creating the racial categories of white and black as the labels to label, to create these labels for the first time in a lot of ways. And then not only create those labels of white and black, but to position them on a racial hierarchy. So the divide, is the creation of the categories, the conquer is the creation of a racial hierarchy. All right, and so in this process, race was invented to protect the elite. So the colonial elite, the landowners, the wealthy landowners are maintaining their power and their status quo throughout this process. Okay, so that, that's a key, key dynamic here. Great. Okay. So as we look more carefully at this machine, we can see that this invention of race included this racial hierarchy of white supremacy. People identified as white were given access to unearned advantages, freedom from slavery, access to stolen indigenous land, and then the racial hierarchy also positioned black people at the bottom, and black slaves were identified as, quote, chattel, property with no rights. And if you're interested in looking at one particular law, I would urge you to look at the 1705 Slave Codes of Colonial Virginia. And they are very explicit about this whole situation. This is not subtle. So they explicitly say, that 
the newly identified white indentured servants, when they finish their time of indenture, which again is a set period of, of time, it's not for life, it's for a set period of time, maybe five to seven years, when they finish their time, there's a list of things that they get, a list of benefits they get. They get food, they get a weapon, they get money, they get clothing, okay, uh, for finishing their time of indenture. The newly created category of black, black slaves are now identified as, quote, real estate, property that could be inherited with no rights, no access to due process, unlike the white servants who are able to go to court and um, speak up if they feel like they're not being treated humanely. Okay, the, the newly created category of black slaves do not have this access whatsoever. Okay, so again, divide a, ma a group of, a massive group of laborers into two groups, give one group a significantly higher advantage, and demote the other group into a system of chattel, racialized slavery. In this hierarchy, Indigenous peoples, Asian Americans, Latinx people occupy various intermediary positions depending on the moment in time, and we'll get, we'll get more to that. Okay, so just go back to, uh, yeah, back one more. Okay, and then, perfect. Oh. So I'll mention again the, um, the film, Race, the Power of an Illusion, 10 Things Everyone Should Know About Race. Again, a really excellent, um, really excellent documentary uh, that has this great website. And one of the things on this website is 10 Things Everyone Should Know About Race. Race is a modern idea. Again, we talked about this idea of it being a recent human invention. And also, this is an issue that um, students are always um, asking about. And they talk in this um, website about slavery predates race. And I'll just read this part because I think this is really key here. Throughout much of human history, societies have enslaved others, often as a result of conquest or war, even debt, but not because of, a phys of physical characteristics or a belief in natural or biological inferiority due to a unique set of historical circumstances, ours, meaning American, was the first slave system where all the slaves shared similar physical characteristics. So yes, slavery existed a thousand years ago, but it was not this system of inherited, racialized slavery. Okay. So as we're chipping away at that false ideology that race is biological, we're clearing away some of that rubble, we're starting to see the racism machine, we're asking what is it, who built it, and when. Now in step three, we can take a step closer to the racism machine and examine its powerful mechanisms and really ask, well, how are these mechanisms operating? What exactly is going on? And so this ideology of white supremacy was built into the creation of this country. And it was built into every system that we have, whether it's law or housing or education or finance or the media, the list goes on and on. And at the same time, patriarchy and capitalism are upholding these ideologies. These are all interlocking forces of oppression that fuel each other. We also need to keep in mind that there were multiple events and actions by the government, mechanisms of laws and government policies that carried out these ideologies. Again, this list can be infinite. Here are just a few examples. We already talked about slavery. Um, we also saw citizenship for whites only, Indian removal, manifest destiny, Chinese exclusion, Jim Crow segregation, convict leasing, immigration restrictions, bans on interracial marriage, the list goes on and on. These are all different types of mechanisms 
that upholds the racism machine at slightly different moments in time. Okay, and we can come back to any of these um, that you may want to, but we're gonna jump to today. And this brings us to myth number three. So this is a powerful myth. Racism occurred in the past, but that problem has been resolved. You might hear things like slavery is over, or the civil rights movement ended racism, or we elected a black president, so racism must be over. Okay, we hear these things, maybe a little bit less now, but we, we had certainly heard these things a lot. The reality, of course, is that systemic racism is a serious, persistent problem in the US today. And there are an infinite number of examples of problems that reflect this systemic nature of racism that disproportionately impact people of color today. Here are just a couple of examples. Mass incarceration, police violence, pollution, maternal and infant mortality, inadequate school resources, poverty, over-surveillance, under-representation, and more. These are systemic problems that disproportionately impact people of color. And as we think about, well, how did we get here? How do we go from the civil rights movement to this persistence of systemic racism? So one of the things that I do in step four, in the fourth chapter of the book, is to consider how did the civil rights, how did racism become recalibrated, not dismantled, after the civil rights movement? And there are many different ways that we can think about this. One way is to think about the power of divide and conquer. So I mentioned before, we saw divide and conquer in that fundamental moment of the invention of race in the late 1600s, a response to rebellion by dividing and conquering the laboring masses. I would argue that we see the same exact situation in the post-civil rights era. So I'm gonna mention a few examples. There are many, many more examples that you could highlight. One example that we don't really spend too much time talking about, but is a key to all of this, is the creation of the stereotype of Asian Americans as the, quote, model minority. Is that a phrase you've heard? Okay, so some of you. So one thing that happened, and if you look at the history of this phrase, you, we can pinpoint it to 1966. In 1966, there were two national news media articles praising Asian Americans as the, quote, good minority. And if there's a, quote, good minority, then what? There's a, a bad minority. And those articles named African Americans as the, quote, bad minority. So one article focused on Chinese Americans in US News and World Report. Another article focused on Japanese Americans and this was the New York Times Sunday Magazine. So these articles, widely distributed, very, very highly read and cited and all of that, became a foundation in establishing the stereotype of Asian Americans as this, quote, model minority. And this stereotype served multiple purposes. So it's 1966. The country, the, the, the Congress, had just passed in 1964 the Civil Rights Act. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act. There were a lot of white people in the country who felt like, we have done enough, we have passed enough legislation, there's been enough change, we're done with these changes, and anyone who is continuing to complain about racism should just be quiet and stop protesting. So that was the rhetoric and the mentality by a lot of white people in that moment. And so this stereotype served a purpose of basically saying to African Americans, if you just act more like the Chinese and Japanese Americans, then you would be successful. And this rhetoric also basically sent the message that racism is a thing of the past, if they can get over it, so can you. And this message also said that the American dream is alive and well. If you work hard, you'll be financially successful. So this one stereotype, it might seem so simple, but it sent all of these messages all at the same time. And then that stereotype just got carried on 
through to the decades, and it is alive and well today. Maybe it takes the form of some nerdy scientist in a TV comedy, right? But it is still, I would say, still sending the same message. And this is extremely damaging and extremely um, supporting this divide and conquer mentality, which is ultimately upholding white supremacy. Okay. So at the same time as that's happening, not too much later, in the 1980s, we see the creation of the stereotype of the, quote, welfare queen. Is that a phrase that you've heard before? Okay. So during the 1980s, under the Reagan era, this stereotype um, became very popular. So before this, which you might not know, before this, the, the mentality um, and the, the mental association of people who received welfare, the assumption was that they were white, which was statistically accurate, okay? But then the creation of the stereotype of the quote, welfare queen, a person who is abusing welfare and a person who is African American, the, the mental image of the person on welfare switched from white to black, even though white people were still the people receiving, the majority of the people receiving welfare. But as soon as you created this notion of, quote, welfare fraud, you create a myth that there is fraud about a group of people you want to demonize, then you can take those social services away. And so we saw the cuts to welfare, we saw the cuts to social services that we are still dealing with today. So again, create a myth of welfare fraud and then remove those rights. We also, at the same time, if you're familiar with Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, we saw the rise of mass incarceration and the criminalization of African Americans, and then a little bit later of Latinx people. And so we, this is um, another contribution to the, um, if we go back to the stereotype of Asian Americans as a good minority, Another factor in the creation of African Americans as a quote, bad minority, was this demonization and criminalization of African Americans through this new Jim Crow um, mentality that really um, kicked off in the 80s and obviously is still alive and well today. And this criminalization of African Americans leads people to, um, leads police to be able to say, I feared for my life, leads white people to be able to say, I'm calling the cops, in Starbucks because, you know, I'm in Philadelphia and there's a lot of customers in Starbucks, right? This idea of not belonging and of assumed criminality. So all of this is built into these divide and conquer stereotypes. We also, at the same, you know, a little bit more recently, but as part of this, see the stereotype of Latinx people as illegal, as not real American. We see the stereotype of Muslims, especially after 9-11, as terrorists, okay? And yes, that is a, a religious group, but at this point, a group that is also being racialized and also being othered. So that connection between race and religion um, is important to think about, and that certainly connects to the rise in anti-Semitism, which we saw just recently in that horrific tragedy in Pittsburgh. Coming back to this notion of creating fraud to strip away rights, we see the same pattern. So again, in the 80s, create the myth that there's welfare fraud and take away rights to welfare. Now, create the myth that there is voter fraud and take away the right to vote. So voter fraud essentially does not exist. And yet, people have been taught that it does exist, and therefore, all of these measures are in place that restrict the right to vote. And that is all part of this divide and conquer mentality. And finally, the glue that sits it all together that has become so powerful is this fear by many white people of becoming the statistical minority in the future. So the year changes, but we see in various census reports that there's a certain year in the future where white people will be the statistical min minority, okay? And as an aside, just because a group is a statistical minority doesn't actually mean they're a minority when it comes to power. Because if we look at 
who's representing everybody in Congress, who is the head of the big giant companies, who's running the media. I mean, that is not a representation of who's actually living in the United States. So that blue, the idea that this white fear of becoming a statistical minority, that is the glue that sort of, you know, bringing together all of these disparate divide and conquer strategies and giving them such power so that they're all kind of interlocking. You might imagine this is like a vicious cycle where they're all connected together. Okay, finally, we just go back, back a step here. Finally, if we think about, okay, so yes, we've just talked about a whole bunch of problems, but we need to think about, well, what can we do? And so the last chapter in my book is about action, about dismantling and taking apart this racism machine. So I have a couple of things I want to say about that, and then it's your turn, and I'm going to ask you to do some work at your table. Okay, so part of this action, part of taking apart this racism machine, is about recognizing how people, especially white people, have been manipulated, and that word I think is really critical, manipulated to believe pervasive and false ideologies that are just in the very air that we breathe. And so, I mean, I've had many conversations with white people who say, I'm not racist, I don't believe any of that. And I say, if you are breathing the air of the United States, you are inhaling this pollution. You can't not breathe it in. And the best thing we can do as white people is to be consciously aware and to consciously resist on a daily basis. The problem, though, is that white people are often not aware of systemic and unearned advantages. They don't often like the idea of um, white privilege, right? And so they respond to the idea of white privilege by saying they don't have privilege, that they work hard for what they have. And so yes, they've worked hard, but almost everybody works hard, right? It's just that depending on your race, your hard work may or may not lead to significant success. Okay, so in addition to white people not understanding and often denying white privilege, They've also been taught that it's not polite to talk about race. So they've already been taught some myths, some false ideologies, and then on top of it, they're told, don't talk about race because it's not polite, okay? Or if you do talk about it, say, oh, I'm colorblind, or I don't see race. Or they're taught race is something that other people have, not white people. And finally, they're taught White people are not really a group. Don't think of us as a group. Think of us as individuals that have individually been successful because of our individual hard work. Okay, so you put this recipe together, right? A lack of education, a lack of awareness, and a warning, don't talk about it. You pour all this together, and what do you get? You get white fragility. Right? So Robin D'Angelo has done a really nice job of talking about that in her book that just came out a couple of months ago. And she talks about white fragility as a defensiveness when confronted with conversations about race and racism and the reality of racism. So again, my perspective as a white anti-racist educator is to really think about how white people need to actively resist how they've been manipulated. Because if we are just passive, then we're just complicit and just kind of breathing it all in. We have to actively resist the myths that I've been talking about by learning the reality behind these false myths. And again, this requires daily, daily work of being actively engaged in this. Okay. So finally, connecting the dots here, if we think on the bigger picture of taking apart the racism machine, we can think about confronting the reality of the racism machine, how race was invented to divide and conquer, how our nation and institutions developed around that fundamental racial ideology. And then this is really key, this idea of how can we resist being divided and conquered? Well, we can think about how can we be undivided and unconquered. If they can't divide us, they can't conquer us. 
And finally, center the voices, experiences, and leadership of those who are marginalized with this critical philosophy, only when the most marginalized are free, are we all free. Okay, now it's your turn. I hope you're ready. So what I would like for you to do is to pick at your table, and don't leave, stay. At your table, I'd like you to pick one of the myths that I talked about. And just as a reminder, these are on handouts. This slide will stay up here. Myth number one, human races are biologically different. Myth two, race has always existed. Whiteness has always existed. And myth three, racism occurred in the past, but that problem has been resolved. At your table, I would like to ask you to just, for the sake of a short conversation, 15 minutes, I would like to ask you to pick one of those myths, okay, and then briefly discuss how you see that myth operating in the world around you. And when I say world, it can be school, it could be work, it could be community, it could be family. You define what that world means. But how is this myth operating in the world around you? And what is, because I've been asked to talk about, to ask you to think about action, what is one action you could take so that myth has less power in the world around you? And some examples are, is there a change on campus that could be made related to policy or club events or curriculum? Um, is there a change in your workplace or your community? Or do you want to think about a different kind of conversation with your friends or family? So you decide the kind of action that you find valuable depending on your situation. Again, I'm going to ask you to take 15 minutes. So it is 7.30. I'm going to ask you to take until 7.45 at your table. Pick a myth. I would not spend too much time on picking the myth. I would just make a decision and then jump into the conversation. Talk about how is the myth operating in the world around you and what is one action that you could take. And then at 7.45, I will ask for, a, maybe not all the tables, but some of the tables to make a quick report back to the room about what were some of the highlights of your conversation. And after we hear from some tables, then we'll open it up to general Q&A. All right? Everyone good? Okay, super. Go for it. <laughs> 
conversation. And then we'll ask for some volunteers to share highlights. Resolve. 
Um, we just discussed like different groups as far as like the alt right movement, um, like Black Lives Matter. Obviously, like this past election has like brought out a lot of like racist feelings, so we discussed that. Um, one way that you can fix it is just having discussions like these and informing and hearing both sides. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Tony. 
black in the United States, but when you were back home in Jamaica or in Brazil or in some other place, you were some other race. So um, the DNA testing just makes me crazy because people somehow think that that means something. Um, like Elizabeth Warren yeah, getting yeah, into yeah. her <laughs> in her situation. But I'd like to hear some of your uh, hear some discussion from other people about these these ideas that forensics tell us people's races, that you can look at a body and, and tell what race that person was, and, and this idea that you can take a spit test and tell what race that, that person is. Great, thank you so much. So let's circle back to that, um, that issue of DNA testing um, in a minute. Let's just hear from a couple more tables on that topic or coming back to the, um, the question here. One of the luxuries about teaching is you get there for the diversity of our population. And so we were dealing with number three, and I was really sort of, my eyes were opened by the point that we were connecting the voter suppression and the, and the um, myth of voter um, fraud to this long history of divided power. So that was very helpful to you. But, um, so as far as the, the solutions, a couple of students here are in Dr. Buzzard's class, and they were pointing out that they had learned that very young children already start those categories. You kind of remember that when you're a child, like you're small children at age two or three, you realize who the boys and the girls are, and this is the same, that can be the same kind of thing. For, so that, so that I think your class was talking about really starting as early as possible, opening up in the ways that you were recommending. I love that idea of thinking in terms of unify instead of divide and conquer. Thinking in terms of just making connections in a positive way, but we have in common. And um, the other one, um, yeah, so I think there, there was one suggestion about finding ways to talk to people who have different political opinions, because that's one of the hardest types of things to break through, and be respectful toward people of other um, beliefs. And, Maybe stay away from some of the media that can keep reinforcing whatever our those structures are there. I think that was, yeah, so, um, yeah. So the one other thing that occurred to me when you were talking about this is that if we have that dark money book, there's kind of like another machine going, which is the financial interest machine. And to some extent, their interests are the same. And so I'm just beginning to see the connections between those two. So that's it. But I just really do feel like that we can be just exposed to as many diverse people as possible. And as you say, we're asking with their basis, you know, a person with the not necessarily that a pitch show of interest in what they're doing, not necessarily, by the way, I like remember somebody talks with an accent that you want to say, what country are you from? And I'm trying to just stop saying that. So just concentrate on what they want to tell me at that time. So I think just to open this to meeting a lot of new people. Comments from table about the activity you just did. Okay, so let's open it up to more general Q and A. And I just wanted um, to come back to your question about um, your comment about DNA testing. So um, in my book, I talk about um, some uh, recent scholarship um, by um, historians of science and social scientists who talk about the rise in the myth number one. And they generally attribute the rise in that myth over the past 15 years to sort of three main things. One is the DNA ancestry testing, and I'll come back to that in a second. Another is the criminal justice system, and we can come back to that. And the third is the pharmaceutical industry. So I'll just very briefly mention an example for each of those if you're, if you're interested. So again, um, one of the things I, I talk about in the book is back you know, around the year 2000, when um, human genome was really being talked about the, uh, and sort of analyzed in, in unprecedented ways, 
people were really, really behind this idea that, okay, race is not biological, race is not scientific, and this idea will just fade away. Okay, <laughs> jump to 2018, and this idea has not faded. It has actually gotten much more powerful. This ideology has become more powerful, and again, in, in part, because of these three things. So DNA ancestry testing. Um, so my perspective about this is basically the way that this testing operates is incredibly complicated. And scientific literacy in this country is frankly not very good. And we don't, I think the average person doesn't know that human beings are 99.9% .9 identical. Okay, if you just ask you know, random people about this, they might say, oh, we're 80% identical. Well, we're probably, I mean, we're, <laughs> we're very, <laughs> we're much closer to, to a chimpanzee than, than, than 80%. And so um, we are an incredibly identical species. So penguins, right? Penguins that we look at and we think, oh, they're, they look all the same. They are, they have more genetic diversity within penguins than human beings do. Okay, same with fruit flies. We think, oh, fruit flies, they're all the same. Well, they are actually much more genetically different than each other than human beings are. Human beings are one of the most genetically and biologically similar species. But that's not really common knowledge. I mean, it depends on who you ask. I mean, scientists would say, oh, that's common knowledge. But you ask people, you know, just wandering around, and that is not common knowledge. And so one of the problems that I think is just we don't have sufficient scientific literacy. So you take a commercial, we see these commercials a lot now, and you were alluding to that, a commercial for any of these companies, it really doesn't even matter which one, and they have some kind of phrase like unlock the mystery of your ethnic ancestry or unlock, you know, your, the mystery of your, um, of your ethnic heritage. They don't use the word race, I will say that, but it is so easy in our culture to, to jump to race, you know, in a second. And so in 30 seconds, these commercials are using what I would say is a lot of the kind of ideology and language of race to um, tap into our desperate desire in the US to categorize people on the basis of race. We get the test done. And again, it doesn't say you're white or you're black. The test do not use those categories. The test does not use race, but we, look at the results and we see race. And so um, in a 30 second commercial, they can't explain all of that. You know, you need at minimum the hour long documentary that I mentioned earlier, where they're actually digging much more deeply into this and race the power of an illusion. And so the 30 second sound bites and even the specials that they do, certainly you can figure out who, in terms of family tree that you might be related to, but in terms of your, you know, your, your, racial, your racial category, there are no tests for that because it is not, again, it's not biological. And the way that these DNA tests work is that they basically have a giant database where they have taken samples, supposedly from all over the world, but more likely the samples that are easier to access. So that already is an issue. And then they compare your sample to this database of samples. And so if the person who they've tested in Finland um, says that, that their family has been in Finland for several generations and they are officially a Finnish person, okay, whatever that might mean, um, then your, if your sample happens to have just a couple of genetic markers that match that person, then your test will say, oh, you're 35% Finnish. Well, what does that really mean? All that really means is you and this random Finnish person happen to have a couple of these markers in common, okay? And so sure, that, you know, that's true. And maybe somewhere in the giant biological family tree, you might have some relationship but ultimately, um, I mean, and these tests might be helpful for other things in terms of medical information and all of that, and I don't wanna dispute that, but I just always talk to my students, just be very, like, very wary of, of the kinds of um, information that's being shared, and just use that critical consciousness um, to question these things. 
There have been some, several examples where people have done their DNA testing from different companies and gotten completely different results because the different companies use different databases. And so, of course, that's going to vary. So again, um, I think that's a, you know, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a critical issue. And I'll just also mention, so again, the rise in the current belief in myth number one, um, I would say, you know, along with many scholars on this, that it's a part due to the, the increase in popularity in DNA testing. It's also connected to the criminal justice system. So in my book, I talk about the kind of language that is being perpetuated. For example, I quote from um, Darren Wilson, the officer who, who murdered Michael Brown, and Darren Wilson, in grand jury testimony, used language that, is, that, that really made it sound like Michael Brown was not fully human. And to me, that is exactly what's going on in myth number one. Okay, call them a demon. And so this is that sort of language is extremely dangerous. So we've got the criminal justice system, we've got the DNA ancestry testing, and I'm not saying the DNA ancestry testing is purposely saying, oh, we want to reinforce, hold on one second, we want to reinforce myth number one. I mean, they're companies, they want to make money, that's their goal, but with that goal comes some damage. And so in addition to the criminal justice system, coming back to the pharmaceutical industry, I would just add that um, there are drugs, market, pharmaceutical drugs, marketed towards specific racial groups. So there is a drug um, related to heart failure that is marketed specifically to African Americans. But <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that African Americans are actually, have a biologically different heart, right? And so the FDA allowed for this marketing um, in part because of the incredible financial opportunities that were available. And there's some really excellent scholarship on this. I, I talk about it briefly in my book, but there's a lot that's already been um, on, written about on this. So again, I think, again, those three areas come together. Again, not necessarily intending to say we're gonna perpetuate myth month number one, but it's about what is the impact. It's not just what is the intention, but what is the impact? And if the impact is that myth number one is getting raised, then that's really dangerous and damaging. So thank you for your question. Um, so let's open it up to other questions and comments. If you, it sounded like you had a comment or a question. How do you think the uh, culture of racism in the 60s and 50s changed now? Because there used to be a restaurant called um, Sambo, and they used uh, antigen mono Right. And at one point, did we have a restaurant in our parks about using culture in America, um, talking about the racism and the stage? Does survival actually have a scene where they divide race, um, people break mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, um, thank you for that question about sort of the culture today versus the culture of the 50s and 60s. So, um, I mean, I guess one of the things that I keep coming back to is that um, in the 50s, throughout the South, you might have seen signs that said whites only, right? Whether it's a, a fountain, a water fountain, a restaurant, a theater. Um, just because you take the sign down, does that mean the institution changes? No. You know, so that's really, for me, that's the issue. So the signs have generally come down. But if the institution hasn't changed, then we still have a lot of work to do, right? So other comments and questions? This is your opportunity. You can share your thoughts, share your, you don't even have to ask the questions, you can share your thoughts about this. We have dialogue like this all the time around, you know, even in our houses and, uh, you know, the students and everything. But we're talking about Machine, right? I, I don't think that we grasp in the the the, uh, the magnitude of what we're talking about here. So how can we take on this massive machine that's been around for hundreds of years, and we just have a bunch of conversations and trying to find a solution when that machine is more like a virus and it's always mutating? It's always it, it always has an answer for you. So by just sitting and having this conversation, we talking about who are y'all? 
I mean, how are you going to take on a pharmaceutical company that's targeting a group of people? I mean, how is that even possible? Great. I mean, that is the question, right? And so, did you want to respond to that, or is that so? I'll just so um, I'll just mention that um, my role as an educator is sort of that in the initial raising awareness and the initial getting people to think about these issues and to start to engage in them. And then it's what's the next step? Well, thinking about what sort of systems do you have closest access to? And um, when I do this more sustained work in the community in New Jersey, one of the things that I focus on is um, what, are, what are the systems that people have the closest access to? So sometimes it's healthcare, sometimes it's education. It depends sometimes on their professional situation or the other situations. And what are the kinds of changes that they can implement you know, as, as a beginning to this? I mean, can we change this overnight? Absolutely not. But I think the only way we can think about dismantling this is to take early steps. And they're going to be small steps in the beginning. They are going to be faltering. They are going to be baby steps. But if more and more people are taking smaller steps versus nobody, you know, versus only a few people taking steps, then, you know, then it's not going to be enough. But if more and more people are taking even small steps, um, I think for me, that, that's, that's progress. And you know, the students that I've had over the past years, um, at some point, you know, they're going to run for office, or they're going to work in a hospital, or they're going to become a teacher. And then how are they going to use this to make changes? And so, just as some examples, some of the people I've been working with have been starting to run for school board in New Jersey. And what kind of changes can you implement you know, in that regard? And so I can't speak about the changes specifically to, to here that, um, that might help dismantle this. But I think for me, if 